can we go, please, uh, in the schedule, first of all, to page 42? Uh, so this is an entry on the 4th of May, and by this stage you are making the notes daily, is that right? Yes. Um, you say, late afternoon meeting with the PM on schools. My God, this is complicated. Models will not provide the answer. PM is clearly bamboozled. And page 53, please. PM asking whether we've overdone it on the lethality of this disease. He swings between optimism and pessimism, and then this. PM still confused on different types of test. He holds it in his head for a session, and then it goes. Um, page 93, please. Watching PM get his head round stats is awful. He finds relative and absolute risk almost impossible to understand. Page 124. PM struggled with whole concept of doubling times, just couldn't get it. And then just two more, please. Page 167. Uh, this is from later in the year, September. Claire Gardner going through the PM graph, sorry, talked PM through the graphs. It's difficult. He asked questions like, which line is the dark red one? Is he color blind? Then, so you think positivity has gone up overnight. Oh, well, oh. then, oh, God, bloody hell. But it's all the same stuff he was shown six hours ago. And then, finally, 389. This is now going forward to 2021. PM dashboard. Is that a reference to a meeting, dashboard meeting? Yes. Taken through the graphs, real struggle to get him to understand them. Um, so the, the question then, Sir Patrick, is those, that, that, those, those paragraphs of your statement that we looked at, yes, you talk about sometimes needing to repeat things and needing to explain things in detail. Help us and tell us if this, this is an example of passages that you, that you um, no longer want to support. But the message that we get from these repeated entries appears to describe something, at least as far as the Prime Minister is concerned, more serious, uh, a repeated failure to understand graphs, uh, scientific concepts, and so on, forgetting things that he'd been, had been explained to him only a few hours earlier repeatedly. Was there a more serious problem with him than that which you describe in the witness statement? Well, I, I think I'm right in saying that the Prime Minister at the time gave up science when he was 15. And I think he'd be the first to admit it wasn't his forte, and that he did struggle with some of the concepts and we did need to repeat them often. I would also say that a meeting that sticks in my mind was with fellow science advisors from across Europe when one of them, and I won't say which country, uh, declared that the leader of that country had enormous problems with exponential curves and the entire phone call burst into laughter because it was true in every country. So I do not think that there was necessarily a unique inability to grasp some of these concepts with the Prime Minister at the time, but it was hard work sometimes to try and make sure that he had understood what a particular graph or piece of data was saying. Um, and I'd learned from a number of uh, meetings, including around climate, where there were certain things that would catch his eye and would work for him and other things that wouldn't work for him. So there were ways of presenting the data that allowed him to get better access than others. It, Mr Johnson, it hardly needs saying, was the man who was making decisions that had incredibly broad impacts on the whole country. A and it was critical, was it not, that he did understand the advice that he was being given? Yes. We've been talking so far about the need to repeat advice sometimes or to, as you say, use particular techniques or tags to help him understand matters. Um, was it ever the case that you had the impression that despite repeating things or despite explaining things in a particular way, he, he actually had completely misunderstood some of the advice that you'd given him? It's possible, but um, I think... Certainly when I left a meeting, I would, be con I would usually be persuaded that we had got him to understand what it was we were trying to say. 
but as one of the extracts showed that you, 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 you put up there, that six hours later he might not have remembered what was, what was in that presentation. So I can't be sure that he kept it in his mind all the time as he was going into whatever the subsequent meetings were that, that, that designed policy. I would also say that I think, and I, I don't know, you'd obviously have to ask him, but I think he does have a technique of almost deliberately going to sort of a misunderstanding just to check that that um, somebody hasn't in a different position. And that was something he would use from time to time. But I think there was a problem in, 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 in scientific understanding, and it's not unusual amongst leaders in in Western democracies. I just and, and he wouldn't be the only person who struggles with graphs, I no. confess to struggling with graphs myself on occasion. Let me just show you a couple more entries, Sir Patrick, just to try and gauge the, the, the issue here. Um, first of all, can we look at page 163, please? Um, so we're in September 2020 now. There's a reference to the Chief Constable saying the rules are too complex. That, that's the subject of different evidence we've heard. But then this, PM looking glum. Then suddenly, and I take it this is a quote from him, is the whole thing a mirage? The curves just follow a natural pattern despite what you do. Incredulity in the room. The whole meeting carefully manages the PM. Is it always like this? Is that an example perhaps of him just being provocative or, 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 or did that demonstrate just a fundamental misunderstanding? It was a point that he raised on several occasions and he would look at the uh, peaks of waves of infection and ask, are the interventions we're making doing that or is this what would have happened anyway? And he did come back to that point often, and we talked him through what the evidence was that the interventions had made the difference. And, of course, it is true that at some point the peak will come down because at some point public behaviour changes, the number of susceptible people changes, the amount of immunity in the population changes. So they do go up and down, but the point was that clearly these were being manipulated down by interventions. Mm. Just before we leave this entry, you see the last sentence there, a note that we're now in September. CMO still keeps offering a slightly slower path. Um, we've talked already about the, the caution that Sir Chris uh, had in, in March. It looks as though you're recording a similar issue in, in, later in the year. W was it something that continued? Well, I think the, the point in brackets is important. I think this is wrong and said it. And, uh, and Chris and I discuss this sort of thing often. I still think that he, as the chief medical officer with a public health accountability, was right to raise the problems associated with the measures being taken. And that appropriate caution, I think, was useful and it was very helpful for the two of us to be able to discuss that and understand why we were in positions of either greater or, or, or slower pace on some of these things. I think it's appropriate. Um, one more of these references, please. Well, page 190. Um, so we're, we're, it's very much the same time, September of 2020. You record that the Prime Minister had come back from the, the Battle of Britain Memorial Service, so distressed by seeing everyone in masks, and then this starts challenging numbers and questioning whether they really translate into deaths. Sorry, into deaths. Um, says it's not exponential, etc., etc. Looked broken, head in hands a lot. Is it because of the great libertarian nation we are that it spreads so much? Maybe we're licked as a species. We're too shit to get our act together. He doesn't seem to have been the easiest of decision makers to, for you to provide scientific advice to, Sir Patrick. It was difficult at times, and um, this is a, an example of where I suspect in this meeting I would not have tried to get across too many scientific concepts. I would have waited for a better opportunity to do so and to have spoken to some others. As you, you mentioned at the outset, you, you had worked with other decision makers, Mrs May, um, was this reception of scientific advice that you were providing something you were used to, or was it out of your experience? Well, uh, he, um, uh, Boris Johnson, and uh, Dominic Cummings were extremely keen to get scientific advice. So they had a, 
I would say, a disproportionate interest in getting science advice. But um, as you can see, it wasn't always easy to provide it in a way that was understood and actionable uh, by the Prime Minister. And I don't think, I mean, I doubt that the sorts of things described in here are terribly surprising to most people. Um, just before we leave this, I, I want to add in one extra factor, which is, of course, we know the Prime Minister was unwell uh, for some period, um, sort of March-April time in, um, in 2020, that the extracts I've shown you do have some in that period, but as we've seen also later. Is that a factor that we need to bear in mind with all this? I think he was, there was a period, and I, I, I described that, when I think he was really unwell and was unable to uh, concentrate on things. When he came back, uh, he eased himself back into uh, things over a few weeks, and thereafter, I think there was no obvious change between him and what he was like beforehand. Yeah. It seems that this policy of transparency did indeed create this type of chilling effect with SAGE itself during the pandemic. Um, if we can go, please to the schedule um, and look at, uh, I think it's three references. Thank you. First of all, this one. We're in June 2020, um, and you, you write, uh, you refer to a paper from number 10. Uh, you say someone has completely rewritten it. They've just uh, cherry-picked, quite extraordinary. And then, for our purposes here, note apparently Simon Case um, I'm afraid I can't now remember whether at that point he had... No, he wasn't. He, he was a permanent secretary within the Cabinet Office at that point. He hadn't become the Cabinet Secretary. Simon Case said, don't bring new schools advice questions to SAGE as the minutes get published. Um, if we can move on to page 102. Another note. Secretary of State um, for Education says, don't ask SAGE as minutes get published. Uh, and then moving forward a few months, both of those references were in June. If we can move forward to page 253, please, we're in October on a similar theme. Apparently the Cabinet Office, so not the Department for Education, but the Cabinet Office, now cautious about putting things to SAGE because we publish it all. That's a very bad outcome. Uh, well, it, it is a bad outcome, um, Sir Patrick, and I, I, I just want to ask for your reflections on what the, where the balance is. I mean, it's, it's up, for all the reasons you've given, there's a lot to be said for publishing the minutes. But on the other hand, if the consequence of publishing the minutes of an advisory body is that its customers don't come to it for advice anymore, yeah. um, isn't that something of a, of, a, of a at least mixed situation? If I may just... On the very first one you, you read out about somebody rewriting the science, that was an internal paper in Cabinet Office, and that rewrite never went anywhere. Right. So, so that, that, that I you. think, is not. But this is a very important question, and there is no doubt that DfE took this view at times, and Cabinet Office, there was a, an alarm that that might happen. I don't think, in the end it stopped us doing anything on schools that we wanted to do, but it did mean we sometimes didn't get precise questions. I do think it's a problem, uh, and I don't know what the answer to it is, but I believe there is a cultural issue which can be overcome, which is the more the principle is accepted that the evidence is published, not the advice, not the policy position, but the evidence is published, the better government decision-making would be. And the more that happens during normal time, as well as during emergencies like this, the more it will become a culturally accepted and reasonable thing. There is a fear sometimes that if the evidence is out there, it's going to force a minister's hand. And as I said, I do think you need to give ministers time to do things before it becomes public. But my approach has been, and I've had this discussion during peacetime in government as well as during the pandemic, is the evidence itself can neither be harmful nor beneficial. It is just what it is. And provided all of the evidence is published, ministerial decision can be completely free to overturn that evidence and say, I choose to do something different. So it's a, it is a worry, and it was a concern, particularly during this period. But I don't think the answer is to reach for more redaction or more 
secrecy around this. I think it's to get into a normalised position where evidence publication is seen as the right route. Sir Patrick, you emphasise evidence in contrast to advice. But what we've seen in these extracts is a concern, in this case emanating from the Department for Education, about SAGE minutes being published. Surely those minutes contain advice? The minutes usually are containing evidence and have it couched in terms of if the aim is to do X, then the following would be necessary. Or given the state of the pandemic at the moment, without a decrease, it's likely to lead to the following situations. It is usually not the case that it's giving direct advice on precisely what the science is suggesting a minister should do. Mr. Patrick, we don't, we don't want to split hairs about this, but thinking about the practical situation that, in this case, the Department for Education seemed to have been in, the thought process appears to be, we have this policy that we're considering. Why don't we ask SAGE about it? Um, one reason not to ask them about it is that if we do, their minutes will record their discussion and you can call it evidence if you like, but that anyone reading it will see, if this is the, 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 the view they took, that they think it's a bad idea. And that will mean that if we go ahead with it, people will criticise us. I mean, that's the problem, isn't it? It is the problem. And again, I think the more you focus on evidence rather than advice, the easier it is. It is a problem. I don't know what the answer to it is. My instinct is that greater transparency is helpful all round. And my experience from the pandemic was that, in the end, none of these came to be a problem. In other words, DfE did try and not bring things to SAGE. We overcame that, and they did, in the end, bring them, and we also did work on it. So they were, they were bumps in the road. They weren't blocks. And I think Stuart Wainwright laid these sort of pros and cons out very nicely in his evidence. Um, I would not wish to see less transparency of the uh, science evidence. Um, let me ask you briefly, if I can, about a similar but slightly different issue. Here we, we, we're discussing the question of whether SAGE were asked at all about issues. There's another issue which emerges from the notes where SAGE were asked, but their advice was either ignored or um, even apparently attempts made to change their advice. Can, can we look at some entries in your sh schedule, please? Um, first of all, page 56. So here we have your comment that we've been excluded uh, from the PM's strategy meeting. Uh, Chris, that's Chris Whitty, no doubt, is sure that it's because the Economic Secretariat in the Cabinet Office want to be able to present things about reopening without us contradicting them. So perhaps that's, in fact, a little like the other ones we were looking at. Uh, page 94, please. Um, the two-metre the, the two -meter rule meeting made it abundantly clear that no one in Number 10 or the Cabinet Office had really read or taken time to understand the science advice. Quite extraordinary. Page 98, please. Uh, number 10 pushing hard on releasing measures they're pushing very hard, and then this, and want the science altered. We need to hold on to our hats. There will likely be a second peak. And then lastly, page 112. Um, in the economics meeting earlier in the day, they didn't realise CMO was there, and the Chancellor said, it's all about handling the scientists, not handling the virus. They then got flustered when he chipped in. So a collection of of entries, all of them, to be clear, um, in terms of date, around sort of May, June, July, reopening in 2020. The common theme is that either SAGE is being ignored, or it's not being asked, or even a, a suggestion um, that the SAGE scientists should be handled in some way, or that their advice should be altered. Um, help us, was there a feeling, perhaps particularly at that time, that perhaps you weren't being asked for your advice in good faith? I think there were definitely periods when 
it was clear that the unwelcome advice we were giving was, as expected, not loved. And um, that meant we had to work doubly hard to make sure that the science, evidence and advice was being properly heard. Now, it doesn't surprise me that there were meetings that we were not included in. That's normal. We were, as I said, in, in number 10 probably for 45 minutes or an hour, and there were things going on all day and political decisions as well. So it's not surprising that we were not invited to things sometimes. Um, and there is, it definitely is the case that there were times when, because we were giving unpalatable evidence and advice, people would rather not hear it. And I think that probably is a normal part of politics. And our job was to make sure that we weren't in the politics. We were continuing to make that advice as heard as we could make it. Did, did you, um, and this I now ask for your view on reflection, not writing your notes late at night, but did you feel uh, that you were in some way being manipulated or handled or that your advice was people were asking you to change your advice well i don't think anyone well i know nobody actually got us to change our advice i mean um uh, the example of somebody maybe putting pressure on us to do it we wouldn't do and i think there's there's a whatsapp exchange you've got where um um matt hancock asked me to change something and i say no um, we're not going to change our advice because that's where the evidence bit comes in, that you've got to at least see that, even if you disagree with it and you don't want to do it. Um, uh, but I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure, because politicians are politicians, that, that there were attempts to uh, manage us and make sure that we were not um, always given the access that, that, that we might need. But I, I think overall we actually managed to get through all of that and make sure that the advice and the evidence was heard. So I don't know what damage it did, and I, I'm not sure exactly what I'd recommend for the future on that, because it seems to me that's partly the nature of um, the way the political system seems to operate.